Physiologically, children are not just small adults. They have a higher surface area to volume ratio in their bodies. They also have a higher respiratory rate and are more likely to get dehydrated. And internally, they produce more heat than adults do. Behaviorally, children don't always recognize the signs that they are dehydrated or that they are overheating, and so they're very reliant on their caregivers to remind them to drink water, to get in the shade, and to rest when it's hot out. My name is Cecilia Sorensen. I'm the director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education and an associate professor of environmental health sciences and emergency medicine, all based at Columbia University. My work at the intersection of climate and heat stress started in Central America in 2017, where I was researching the impacts of heat stress on agricultural workers and how that related to the epidemic of chronic kidney disease of unknown origin. Now I devote my time to training health professionals globally as to how they can prevent, respond, and reduce the impacts of climate change on the health of their communities. And I work to build health system readiness and response. So the way the body normally cools itself is that an area in the brain recognizes that the body is heating up. And what happens then is that blood is shunted to the skin and we also increase sweating, which cools us through radiation, as well as when cool air runs over our skin, the force of convection can help disperse heat. Now, when it's very hot out and also when it's humid out, those normal mechanisms to cool us down don't work. Secondly, we know that heat independently is what we call a teratogen, meaning that it alters normal development. And in regards to heat, it's teratogenic in the sense that it impairs normal cardiovascular system development as well as nervous system development. It's been found that infants born during a hot season are actually breastfed for a shorter period of time than are their peers born during a cold season. Having a shorter period of breastfeeding during that crucial developmental window can actually have impacts on the child's development, which can last a lifetime. A great resource is the technical note by UNICEF, which I helped to develop, which is called Protecting Children from Heat Stress. This is a framework which contains four actions which can be taken throughout communities to prevent morbidity and mortality as a result of heat. We use an acronym called BEAT THE HEAT to remind us of the different actions. B stands for be aware. E stands for easily identify the symptoms. A is for act to cool the body. And T is to take immediately to a health facility if symptoms are severe. Our hope is that this technical guidance can be used by stakeholders throughout the community in order to reduce risk of children suffering from heat-related illnesses. Caregivers and parents should keep a very close eye on children during heat exposure periods. That includes when they're outdoors playing and even when they're indoors playing. Parents and caregivers need to remind children to drink water frequently, to rest, and to cool off in the shade. And they should monitor for early signs and symptoms of heat illness using the Beat the Heat framework. Next, caregivers and parents of infants should consider bundling the infant loosely during the heat season to allow the infant to cool off naturally. We also recommend that breastfeeding continue throughout the heat season, and we recommend that breastfed infants are not supplemented with water during this time, but the pregnant women should remember to stay well hydrated. Our hope is that this framework will be used throughout communities globally by stakeholders, including school teachers, coaches, and frontline health workers to be able to reduce the impact of heat on children's health. There are so many ways that we need to urgently prepare healthcare facilities to be able to diagnose and treat appropriately heat-related illness. The first thing we need to do is to build the capacity of our frontline health workers to be able to recognize the symptoms of heat stress for infants, small children, pregnant women, and the general population, knowing that the treatment varies depending on who the patient is. Second, we need to be thinking about how resourced our facilities are with the proper equipment we need to rapidly cool heat victims. And this includes having things on hand such as copious amounts of ice, 
chilled fluids, ventilators, and more. Health facilities are a refuge during heat waves, and they can prepare themselves for this by making sure they have cool public areas where people can remain safely during heat waves without increasing the risk of spread of infection. Pregnant women are also vulnerable for physiologic reasons because their bodies are undergoing so many different hormonal as well as uh, volume status changes during pregnancy. We know, for example, that pregnant women who are exposed to extreme heat are at higher risk of suffering from gestational diabetes as well as preeclampsia. Furthermore, we know that women who are exposed to extreme heat have a higher risk of stillbirth as well as preterm delivery, and that this risk increases proportionally with the temperatures that they are exposed to. Pregnant women should work moderately during the heat season, take frequent rest breaks, and remember to drink plenty of water. Health care systems can also support women during this time by allowing appointments to be scheduled in the early parts of the day as well as the evening when it is cooler. The next thing we can do is to make sure that healthcare systems are connected to meteorologic services in their region so they can receive advance notice when there's going to be a heat wave. This will allow health systems to be able to pre-position resources such as vital staff as well as equipment to prepare for potential surges of patients. Last but not least, we should be considering health facilities as cooling centers because we know that communities and surrounding areas will often go to health centers in order to cool down. Children's environmental health is crucial globally right now. We have a moral imperative to ensure that all children everywhere have access to clean air, clean water, healthy food, so that they can reach their potential.